contrary to what Bob, contrary to what Bob is worried about, we're going to have some fun here. Jeez, um, he was just here like 1990. It was like yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought maybe we'd start with a couple of questions, sort of that let you get to know Bob a little bit. Um, so they they played one of the great Super Bowls of all time last month. Which of the teams did you like? <laughs> really? We're going to do sports That's questions? That's kind of what I thought. I don't even know who played. That's right, don't you know. don't. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's the Oscar broadcast. Who would you think is the best picture nominee? Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. Because you don't watch a lot of movies. Right, yeah. That's, that's... Um, Breaking Bad or Sopranos, which of those series did you like best? Yeah. You I, yeah, well, you're just not on my channel. Because yeah. you live... What I'm trying to convey is you live in Bob world. Right, right. right. Well, what do you do? Tell, tell them what you do now. I know I live in the scientific bubble. That's just about it. I mean, you know, it's uh, my my work is my life. Whether I'm working or having fun, it's pretty much the same thing. So it's uh, I don't know. I pretty much do the same thing. Where it's, you live and what you do, your business. I unfortunately live in Michigan. <laughs> so and, you're glad to be in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, I, I would really like to be back here, but um, yeah, the business is United Nuclear Scientific. We sell. Uh, and build lots of uh, scientific equipment and supplies, supply it to schools, universities, the government, you know, everybody. We also do contract work. We do R&D work, design, construct, prototype, gadgets, weird things for different companies. If they have a problem or something they're trying to solve, they'll come to me and just say, make this work. And, you know, so we do. But the bulk of it is really just selling scientific equipment and supplies. and. You know, trying to bring that back. Back when I was a kid, you know, used to be able to go into a uh, hobby store and buy chemicals and have a chemistry set. Now, if you see any glassware in somebody's house, you just think they're cooking up meth or something like that. So, <laughs> you know, we try to change the tide and bring back hands-on stuff into, uh, you know, the current generation. That's one of the stories told about you, right? That you had a meth lab among other. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, do you have any government uh, contracts? We do government contracts. Um, you see where that could go. People, aha, he's working for the government, they're paying him off. He, he did his job, spread this information, now he's, he's working for the government. You're not working for the government. No, I don't work for the government, but you know, if there's contracts, I bid on it. And you know, every faction of the government doesn't know what the other one's doing. It's, <laughs> it's a complete mess. I want to give them an idea, you know, the question is raised, you're not a scientist, what kind of scientist are you? And I, I haven't been to your house in Michigan, but the last time I visited you, it was in New Mexico, and there was something built in the house, the building right behind your home. It was, as I recall, a 30-foot particle accelerator. Yeah. You, you built yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. What, what did you do with that? What do, you, what do you do with your home particle accelerator that's 30 <laughs> feet long? <laughs> well, at the time, um, you know, we're working on uh, an efficient way of storing hydrogen for, you know, automotive use so it can be used as a fuel. And um, some of the most efficient um, hydrides, materials that absorb hydrogen like a water, like a water, like a sponge absorbs water, um, were restricted because they were used in thermonuclear hydrogen bombs. And so you couldn't purchase these materials, but there was kind of a loophole in the law where you could make them. So I had to make a particle accelerator to make the material to use and run tests on. So that's what that was all about. You moved to Michigan in part because you thought that you were going to have some help from state government with the, the system, right, the hydrogen system. Yeah, kind of. I mean, a lot of things changed. I mean, we moved partly because of, you know, family reasons out there and just to get a change from the Southwest, which I regret. And... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, there was a, a lot of, at the time, there were a lot of unemployed auto workers, and we thought, you know, we can hire those, but, um, you know, a lot of things happened. The recession happened, and also at the same, not at the same time, but around 2008 or something, the uh, uh, Chinese, who at the time were making a lot of the rare earth uh, elements, um, because they did it cheaply, and the U.S. mines had shut down years beforehand, uh, decided, boy, now that, you know, we pretty much control the market on it, we're going to go ahead and crank up the price, you know, 10 or 100 times what it was, and it, it really made what we were doing impossible to do profitably. So 
you know, you, 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 your business is science related, you sell scientific equipment, you build things like a particle accelerator and jet car engines and things of that sort. Uh, but I, I think if, if you heard me talking earlier, you'd have to agree with a lot of people that you don't fit the mold as a typical scientist. I mean, you're not a member of any science organizations, are you? No, 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 no. Do you write papers? Do you submit papers to? I mean, not, not typically, not in, the, not in the normal sense. I mean, you know, the, when I first went to Los Alamos, what was really annoying to me was the, the boy, the, the typical pompous, self-righteous scientist, you know, and they would come into town and, uh, you know, interact with the ordinary people and, you know, use terminology that was over their head just to get them to say, well, what do you mean by that? And the chest would puff up and, the, you know, it boosts their ego and it really annoyed me. So, you know, when I worked there, I relabeled some, you know, important equipment, whirly gig or something along those lines and, it, you know, it really pissed them off and, um, you know, it was really just to, but it, to make a long story short, you know, I was the new guy coming from the West into the, you know, hardcore scientific field and it, uh, you know, really I was able to run circles around these guys because they, they, they followed a, a set path and did a, a set amount of things. Their, their support teams were, were very limited and weren't engaged in them because they had no idea what was going on. They never took the time to, you know, bring these guys in. But um, I don't know. I just looked at, a, looked at things from a different point of view and I simplified things. So explaining technical matters on a simple level. And I do that a lot and people say, well, boy, you don't talk like a scientist. Yeah, I'm trying to make everyone understand, you know. But, um, and, it, and it works, you know, if you, if you talk on a, a simple basic level, everyone is going to understand what you're talking about. It's easy to talk over everybody's head, but all that does is make you look like an idiot. You know, when I first met Bob, uh, I remember going to his house and there was a, a skull and crossbones flag flying over his, his house at the time. He had yeah, this really. giant jet car parked in the, in the, in the driveway. He had these videos that he shared with me that we used in one of those reports where it's a lot of machine guns. He had a lot of really interests, the kinds of interests that you don't associate with scientists. I mean, you heard my comparison to Edward Snowden. I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable, but I mean, he's, it's sort of the same vein. There was a guy who had no academic credentials. He uh, didn't make it through high school. He took online hacking classes. He worked as a security guard. The next time they hear from him, he's working, he becomes a computer expert for CIA and NSA. I mean, it sort of fits the mold. He, he doesn't fit the mold in the same sense that you don't. No, but he fits the new mold. You know, he doesn't fit the old mold, just as what we're, we're used to seeing. But they I don't mean, need a degree. No, no, no. They're, they're looking for talent. I think they, long, they learned a long time ago that they were missing a lot of creative people and people that would think outside the box. And if you really want to move forward, that's where it is. Especially with computers. Oh, yeah, no, no, no doubt, yeah. Let's, let's get to flying saucers. Um, you got hired through eg and to work for the U.S. Navy. Yes, Do you remember day one, the first day out there? No, first day out where? First day out at the, at the facility. How you well, got the, fir first day, the first day was going to, you know, Area 51 proper and signing all the agreements and doing all that stuff. Signed agreements. What, what kind of agreements did you sign? It was really there? paperwork and going over, you know, exactly what I was going to be doing. And it was you know, a lot of security stuff. I mean, they were questioning, you know, my family, where we had moved. It was, you know, boring, nothing. They had investigated you. Area. They'd been around talking to everybody you knew. Yeah, yeah, clearly. And because I already had previous security clearance, um, you know, it made it a little earlier, as opposed to somebody starting from scratch, which typically takes like 13 months, from what I understand, to do a top secret or civilian queue clearance. Did you have the clearance that you needed to work there when you started working there? Or did that no, 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 no. I just had a convenient starting point where, you know, they didn't have to go back to the day I was born and you know, verify that. They go, okay, well, you had clearance here and we can go from there. So you get on the plane in Las Vegas, Janet plane. Yeah, right. Fly yeah. up there, they put you on a bus with the blacked out windows. Oh okay. yeah, when we were going S4, right. Yeah. S4, so the, the, you don't take, you land at Groom Lake. Land at 51 and then. You sign some papers. Yeah, if you want to make it a short version, yeah, right. Um, you had told me the story that they started showing me these briefing books that sort of laid out the general story. Was that at, at Groom or was that? That was at S4. That was at no, S4. that material would never get north of. Uh, the people who work at Groom Lake who say, 
I never heard any of this stuff. Of I never course. saw any flying saucers. Oh, there is no flying saucer stuff at 51. No, that's, uh, look, 51 is, uh, it's a, there's lots of people working there. It'd be hard. There's, when I worked at S4, again, I have no idea how it is today, but you know, back in my day at S4, there were 22 people that had clearance and knowledge of the ET material, ET crafts. That was it. We were given the list. We knew the names on the list. That was it. I still know that, the names on that list today. And those are that some of the things that I never say any, anything to you about because... Yeah, why is that? Well, exactly. <laughs> there has to be some stuff I keep to myself because you know how many times people said, yeah, hey, I worked out there with Bob and so on and so forth. Really, who are you, what'd you do, and whatever. And it's only the stuff I said. I'm waiting for the guy that says, hey, yeah, I worked out with you, and here's some of the other people on the list. Or we did this, or is it, so it's, if I don't keep that stuff, there's nothing I have to verify if some other guy comes up to me. You see it all the time, though, don't you? I imagine you get emails all the time, or, or you read stories, or you hear claims on, if you watched television, you'd hear it, that is, uh, about people who claim they've been out there, and obviously they're making it up. Well, I mean, the most recent was this... Uh, Bushman? I think it was like, yeah, like a, the CIA guy or something like that. Was it... It was an anonymous it, guy who had a... He, said he was he dying died. or he died. Yeah, yeah. and uh, a lot of people asked me, hey, do you know... And I, he was apparently very supportive of me, and, uh, but I never heard of him. And what am I going to say? I, I've never heard of the guy and never seen him. Back to day one, you're, you're at Groom. You take a bus to S4 to Papoose? Yeah, it was an old Bluebird school bus, but navy blue. How did you know it was called S4? Did you read that on something? No, it was just what they said. That's what they called it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see it written down on anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an S and a 4 or S-4 or S-F-O-U-R or? No, it's a num numerical 4. Just S and 4, yeah. okay. And so you get to S4 and you see what? Describe what you saw. Well, the first time I went, we went around, it's kind of hard to describe. There's a, a little mountain or rise, whatever, that, that ends. And the first time, I have to admit, I didn't notice it. Uh, we just drove around, and I thought it was just a flat part of the mountain. At the very end is an entrance, a flat wall with doors, and that's where we parked. We went in. And that's the first time I went into the facility at all. Um, that's where I was taken to the medical facility. Um, that's where I was given the briefings initially. And it, was, it wasn't until the second time that I was taken down there that we stopped in the middle because the side that I thought was flat was actually hangar doors that were, you know, really cleverly blended into the side of the mountain. To look like desert. Yeah, yeah, great job. When you're inside, can you see all the hangar doors? Or you, you can only see all, all nine of them or whatever it is that, from outside. What do you mean when if, you're if inside? If you were inside, looking at, in one hangar, can you see all the way down, see all of them, see more? Or is there separated? Yeah, there's, there's inside each hangar bay, there's, you know, if there's the big door that goes to outside, inside on the sides, I guess I could use the whiteboard. There's, um, oh, what the hell. Okay. <laughs> All right, this is going to be a tough one. Okay, so. You <laughs> can't see it. All right. <laughs> is that making any sense? So there's uh, the doors here where this is, you know, Papoose Lake. The main doors here roll up. However, inside there are regular doors. And on one occasion, these doors were all open. And when I came into the, came in through here on the first, uh, well, I think it was the first time they showed me, well, there's the craft in here. Um, these doors were, yeah, these doors were all open, and you could see that there were different craft in each. In each so those are the doors I'm talking about. Let's talk about the whirly gigs, or whatever you want to call them. So the, talk about the first time you saw one of them. Was it the, the first time I saw one of them was the uh, second time I came in. The end, the last uh, bay door was open. That was the sport model that was sitting in there. 
Uh, we pulled up, we stopped. Instead of going around in the front normal entrance, we went in through you know, the big bay door. You, before, you, who had seen these posters you described that were on the walls? Yeah, Tell yeah, the They're Here posters. Describe what the posters Yeah, they went through the trouble of actually making uh, a picture of the sport model that was lifting, obviously, off of Papoose Lake, because you can see the, the background there, and it just said, They're Here. And it was, it was like a commercial poster. I mean, they looked like they were lithographed. I mean, uh, they must have been printed on site. They wouldn't have done that out there. But, obviously, uh, somebody's idea of a joke. Yeah, uh -huh. it was good to see that, that level of, uh, I don't know, lightheartedness out there. First day you get a look at the sport model, what are you thinking to yourself? Oh my God, what are you thinking? No, it was flying saucer did not, alien flying saucer did not enter my mind. It, well, it, was, it, was, yeah, it was exactly the opposite that, uh, well, this explains all the UFO sightings that, you know, we have some field propulsion technology. It has to be in this, you know, shape or form, you know, flying saucer type. And this is what people have been seeing for a long time thinking that they're alien craft and it made perfect sense to me. It's like, great, I'm, I'd really like to be part of this project, advanced propulsion, this is dynamite. So I was excited to be part of it. In fact, when we went by it, um, and I think I'd even mentioned to you, it had a little American flag stuck on it yeah. and I dragged my hand across it and you know, it felt like you know, cold. So I just assumed it was metal and got yelled at immediately. You know, don't keep your hands at your side, walk forward. All right, and You're so thinking to yourself, oh man, I'm, I am part of the coolest inside joke yeah, in yeah, history because yeah. we've got flying saucers that we've made and we're playing a joke on everybody. Or like, no, I wasn't really playing a joke. It was that, you know, this is cool technology and by at any time we feel like we can probably just take over the world of America, you know, and that was that <laughs> attitude. So at what point do you realize we didn't make it? How did you learn that? Is that the briefing books? Well, yeah, the briefing books just did not make any sense. We started into... You know, that, uh, that, that actually you know, predated seeing that. And I, I really don't know, the, the briefing books covered a little bit about a lot of topics. And it, it dealt with, uh, you know, analysis of, uh, it was all back engineering material, analysis of metal, you know, power systems, and the way things were, uh, even, even the way things were laid out within the craft. And, um, Again, it really had me confused and going is, it, it, it was so far beyond what I was expecting. Is this, is, is this some kind of test or is this actual material? So it just, you know, I thumbed through everything and went, okay, and just went on it from there. But it really didn't hit me until I went in, I was introduced to my uh, working partner who was Barry Castillo or whatever I pronounce his last name. And um, the way they worked there was uh, everything was very compartmentalized, so everybody had a buddy to work with. And that is the only person you can talk and converse with and bounce ideas off of. You can't talk to anybody else in any other group. You can't, you know, even if we go sit and there's a bunch of other people around, you can only talk to the guy, you know, your buddy, they called him. So anyway, so he was my buddy. and. Um, when I, the first day we went in there, he was excited to show me everything. And it, it seemed like he had been alone for too long. And it was, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was you know, really excited that I was there. And um, I was kind of picking up on his enthusiasm going, well, let's, he said, boy, you are going to just die when you see this. And, you know, and, um, you know, one of the first things he did was, you know, fire up one of the, the reactor that had been taken out of the crowd. Tell that story. Tell it. <clears throat> Um, the reactor is a, it's a small device, it's probably, you know, just roughly a foot square with a half a hemisphere on it. Um, <laughs> half a hemisphere? A hemisphere. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a, there's really nothing there. The, the top comes off and there's like a, a little tower on it. Um, it draw does, it. hmm? Draw it. Well, <laughs> Oh, this is my eraser here. Huh? Can you see the drawing in the back? No? no. Pretty tough. No? Oh, these guys can't. Can. That's not fair. You have to watch it on the screen.
Was anything about the, this in the briefing books about how this worked? You did read about this before you got There's to very it. little about this. Okay. Essentially, you know, for size comparison, half a basketball on a plate that was probably... Not a whole lot of moving parts, nothing really... No, nothing. I mean, it's just incredibly simple. There was, there was nothing there that, so could, that could do anything for... Yeah, and it was too small to hold any large power source or anything. So what did he show you? Anyway, the, the, the top came off, and uh, he put the top on, and then he said, go ahead and, and, and grab the sphere. And as my hands approached it, I couldn't touch it, which was uh, fantastic. And if you've ever played with magnets, I'm sure everybody has, you take two light poles of a magnet and you can kind of feel that bounce. It was exactly, exactly like that, but it was my hands. They weren't magnetic. And he says, you're feeling an artificially produced gravitational field. And that really floored me. And, you know, that I began to run through in my mind, how can this be a joke or faked or there's just, there's no way. And um, it, that, that, that's the first time that it was kind of a domino effect than what I had read in the briefings and going, D these guys aren't kidding. This is unbelievable. Let's go back to briefings for a second, and then we'll come back and you can tell us a little bit more how this operated. In the briefing books, you see the craft described, and then you get into some more exotic stuff that you really you had to wonder, are they messing with your head? Alien stuff. Yeah, there was, it, it was a one and only um, briefing, whatever you want to call it, uh, or an overview of, the, it was split, the, the entire program there was split into individual projects and, um, you know, each had an overview of each project and each group got an overview of all the other projects in case there was some connection to what they were doing, but it was clear they didn't want everybody to know everything. And although the military loves doing that, it it really, really screws up trying to move forward and... and Too you know, compartmentalized, you can't... It, it, it's it. insane, but they really enjoy that. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the uh, only thing that dealt with any kind of, you know, biological... Entities? Uh, it, yeah, that's essentially what you'd call them. There was just uh, a view of, of a creature and like closest estimation I can give you is a gray because it had a, a head with the large eyes, but the, what they were focusing on was a, a T-cut in the chest, and it was one large organ, and the comments were about how um, it functioned as a, a liver, a lungs, a heart, as if all organs had grown together or evolved together, where it was just, uh, I don't know, an all-purpose internal organs. Yeah, I guess. I don't really have an analogy for it. But um, that was it. And they were, and the uh, accompanying photographs were that was the, um, that organ removed. It was sectioned. It was showing the different chambers. There were indications of it. There were the weights of the different pieces that they removed. So I, again, I don't know where the thing came from, you know, where that, this was just a briefing of something else, but it was, uh, so you know, th is, there's nothing in the briefing book that says this comes from X planet, or, and you're, you're wondering yourself, are they messing with us, right? Are they messing with me? Are they testing? Right. Me? I mean, I, well, it really didn't. It, it, it really didn't hit me at the time. Uh, it seems they wanted me up to speed really fast, to where they, they were skipping too many places to make me feel comfortable. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't realize that everybody got these, and you know, the people that dealt with the biological connotations of everything. We're getting metallurgy reports. And again, it was just in case there was some connection, you know, you could kind of raise your hand and say, wait, you know, this thing might relate to us in some way. Did Barry or anybody else tell you why they wanted to get you up to speed so fast? Were there some urgency there or were they just tired of not making progress or what was it? That was never really clear. I know there was some accident prior to me being hired and, um, you replaced somebody who'd Yeah, killed. I replaced somebody. Somebody was, was killed. And it was playing with the reactor. And, you know, they said, well, we're going to be working on the reactor. And I went, well, <laughs> you know. Um, but so, yeah, there was obviously a lot of caution being taken. But I, uh, from what Barry said and what Dennis said, who is my immediate supervisor, was that, you know, they were trying to make leaps and bounds way too fast. And, you know, uh, I was certainly not planning on doing anything like that, especially hearing 
the news. Are they? Well, you see, thinking to yourself, I shouldn't be here. Why have they got me here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, there's a billion people they could have hired, you know, that I thought would have been, uh, you know, a better choice for that. But um, they were, they really wanted somebody, it seems like they were stuck. And they wanted somebody coming from left field with just new ideas, just get us out of the rut and just move something forward. Man, well, they, they get the right guy, the mayor of left field. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know um, if that's the way to do it. Let's go back it. to talk about the reactor. So he showed you with this experiment in your hands, you could feel it's a force field, and how they fake that, if they were faking it, is amazing. No, I don't think you can. Then you saw some other stuff, the golf ball. Yeah. Demonstration. Tell me that story. Tell us that. Well, that wasn't really supposed to be a demonstration, but... Um, it, well, in some way it was, and you know, once I said that's that's unreal. This is a gravitational field, and you can see that. You know, it's extremely strong by it, and it tapers off, and you know, it's following the inverse square law, which is you know the, uh, the gravity radiation. Uh, the the inverse square law is essentially you know uh, the uh, amount of energy dissipates really quickly as distance increases. So, um, you know, it, 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 that was immediately noticeable to me. And he said, well, check this out. And, you know, he had a golf ball and he, you know, winged it at the thing and it bounced off the field coming nowhere close to the, the reactor. And, you know, we have those ceiling, suspended ceiling tiles in there. <clears throat> and it knocked it out of place. And, you know, he flipped out and said, you know, you know, Dennis is going to be back in here, so jump up on there. We're trying to arrange stuff and, you know, <laughs> fix the thing. And he's knocking the, the reactor around and going, oh, man, it's my first day, you know, don't screw everything up. <laughs> so, and I'm taking the dust off the thing. And boy, the second we finished, you know, Dennis walks inside and is, how are things going? She's <laughs> great, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was uh, something. I say, it's day one. You've read this interesting briefings. You don't know quite what's going on. You do see this technology. It's damned amazing. What is your job? What do they tell you you're supposed to do? Uh, the, the bottom job is not to figure out how this thing works or, you know, let us know what this met is. Just can we make another one of these? So just let us know if you can. Can we duplicate yeah, the technology? Yeah, can we duplicate it? Like it, it? It doesn't have to be exact, but find out how this thing works. If we need to make something that's bigger or do it just, but we want more of these things and just do it right now. So that was it. And the answer is, can we? I mean, can we? No. 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 No, we're just not, not even in the same ballpark. Is it because of materials, or we just don't understand? Yeah, it's, how it it's, works? it's it's both. Look, this is like dropping off an iPhone in the wagon train days and say, "We're going to need more of these." <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Did you uh, did you ask anybody? Hey, where do we get these? Where did these come from? No, I I really did, that? there was so much other stuff that was flooding my brain that was just amazing and uh, you know I was so excited to be there it's, I didn't care where the thing came from it's you know it was beginning to trickle into my mind boy this is maybe with you know flying saucer crashed in South Africa or something and we got it and we're taking it apart this is great you eventually saw all of them or you saw glimpses well of when I looked through the doors so I could see as far as you could tell they looked they didn't look like they'd been in a crash Right. Well, there's one. One. There's one, and I mentioned this to a long, to you a long time ago, and I, I never added this one thing, which I'll add now. There was one, like I said, that had been shot with a projectile, um, and I know for a fact it came out of the water. That's all I know. You know it for a fact because that's what you were told. Yeah, that it came so out it had of the water. So a great big projectile, like a howitzer shell or something, right there. I know, it was about. It's hard to judge from distances, you right. know, like from here to the exit sign, how big is that? But I'm guessing it was, what, a, maybe a nine inch diameter hole? The sport model, no dents, no scrapes. No, it looked like it came right out of the showroom. And it looked yeah. like the Billy Meyer beam ship. Yeah, from the pictures I've seen of the Billy Meyer one, which, you know, it looked fake to me, but no, there it is. I'm sure the Billy Meyer people are happy about that, but I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of people don't take that case seriously. And, um, 
It's either the most amazing coincidence, coincidence on the face of the earth or something really did happen to that guy, Billy Meyer. So the sport model, you called it. You had names for all of them. Yeah. What, yeah. Give me some other names. Well, there's one that looked like the top hat, and one was a, obviously a jello mold, and <laughs> I, you know, but it was, they were just silly names because we were talking about them, and, you know, they're talking about bird six, and I'm like, what's that? Is that the jello looking thing? You know, so I gave them my names, and they stuck with them like they did at Los Alamos. Um, so the sport model, you got to know that one pretty well, though. You got to see Yeah, it's the only one I, I can on. say I hands-on, I touched, I walked in, you know, that I can say for all the, the other ones could have been holographic projections to fool me, but um, this is the only one I know is real. Before we talk about the test, uh, one other thing about the reactor, and I, I want you to use this example to sort of explain how it worked. You had told me a story about uh, a candle and, and yeah. a flame that was basically frozen. Tell me that story and why it gives us an indication of how this thing operated, what power it had. Well, when we had, you know, after the golf ball incident, there was the benches we had set up. The reactor was not the only thing in the craft. The reactor sits in the center. On the level underneath, there are, well, I should say the reactor. Surrounded by the reactor, there are three gravity amplifiers, as they were called. Directly under those, there are emitters, which are, um, oh, probably like 55-gallon drums. There are three of them. They hang directly under the emitters, and apparently the way the device works, excuse me, is um, the reactor supplies the base gravitational wave and power to the amplifiers, which channel it down to the emitters, which propel the craft. So in addition to the reactor that was out of the craft, uh, one of the emitters was also on the bench. Now, I don't know which craft this came out of. Um, it was not out of the sport model, but um, they had the uh, reactor operating and the emitter, and Barry had taken a candle and put it about, well, I'd say about two feet from the end of the emitter and lit the candle. And he fired up the reactor, and he said, go check out the candle. And the flame was there, but it wasn't moving. It was like a picture of it. It was just frozen. And now that makes you think of a lot of things. Oh, boy, if it's, we know gravity and time are interrelated, and you know, one is essentially the other. And fine, if gravity, if it stopped or slowed time down there, how are photons still being emitted so we can see the light? It should just go black. Um, you know, there are a lot of things made absolutely no sense whatsoever with you know, the science we're familiar with. But um, this is, these were just things he was showing me as a demonstration that, uh, you, know, um, you know, properties and what it's doing that are just so far beyond what we even know what's going on. And this had nothing to do with the work. I mean, we're, uh, we're just supposed to <laughs> make another one of these things somehow. So, <laughs> you know. So uh, help us understand what this technology means, how advanced it is. Uh, how, you know, it becomes obvious at some point it's from somewhere else we didn't make it because we're taking it apart to figure out how it works. Look, a machine that makes gravity is the most important thing that mankind could probably create. Look, we have electromagnets that make magnetic fields. You know, we can make electric fields, we, you know, with Van de Graaff generators and, you know, God knows what else. But, you know, to make a gravitational field is like the, uh, the last piece of a missing pie. Because when you can, right now, the only thing that makes gravity, as far as we know, is mass. You just need a bunch of stuff and it's a property of mass that it just magically pulls in things. You know, we observe gravity, we see what it does, but we really don't know what it, what it is. We can throw some equations together and say, well, it works like this, but we really don't know what's behind it. But if you can make a machine that on demand makes gravity, you know, all the stuff we write science fiction about stops becoming science fiction that afternoon. Then force fields become a reality. You can shift time. I mean, everything becomes possible. It's, uh, it's, it's the most important thing. And here is an operating machine sitting in front of us that makes gravity. And do we really want to be able to make one of those things?
I mean, you could make impenetrable fields. You can do, have propulsion that uh, is mind-boggling as the crafts operate. It would be the ultimate weapon. Well, not, it, not just the ultimate weapon, but it would really be the ultimate thing. It would, it would catapult mankind forward. And what really sucks is the military is in control of this. I should... Uh, mm. yeah. I neglected to mention this during my presentation, but Bob and I have talked about it before, a guy named Ben Rich, who uh, Jim Goodall knows and, and interviewed several times. Ben Rich was the head of the Skunk Works, which uh, was the, they operated things at, at Groom Lake and, uh, and had been there. They developed the U-2 and SR-71 and Stealth. If anybody would know about advanced technology, it's him and Kelly Johnson. So um, a lot of people have speculated whether Ben Rich uh, and those guys had incorporated alien technology into some of the advanced airframes that we've got. And I even had a chance to ask him on the day that the stealth was unveiled out there at Nellis whether any alien stuff was in there. He said no. But other people have talked to him. Jan Harzan, who's here from MUFON, heard a speech that Ben Rich gave at UCLA in which he basically said, we now have the technology to take ET home. We had the calculations slightly wrong, but we can do anything you can imagine. We can travel to the stars. But, he said, the technology is locked up in black, bu black budgets and black programs and will never see the light of day. What do you think about that? Well, that's sort of like the same thing you're saying. Yeah, that sounds exactly like what I'm saying. You know, I hope that's not the case, but I mean, how do you pry it out of there? It's, it's, it really, there should be a lot more people working on this. That a was, lot more people. Well, that, that's sort of what, why you became disenchanted with it, but we'll come back to that. Let's talk about the sport model a little bit. You got to see it fly. You got to see a test. Yeah, once. To, well, that. once close up. Um, we, Barry and I were in the lab. We were working. Um, Dennis came in and he said, there's a test flight going on. Bob, why don't you come out here? Barry, you can tag along too. Um, and that's when we came in, you know, side door into the hangar. Um, the craft was already out onto the dry lake bed in front of, or the uh, lake bed proper, but it was out in front of the uh, uh, door. Um, and probably about two minutes after I got there, the craft just began to silently lift off the ground. And there was a guy between where I was standing and the door that had a small desk and there was uh, some sort of transmitter on it and he was just on a microphone talking apparently to somebody in the craft. And at the time, that again immediately set up a red flag in my mind going, that's not supposed to work either. There is a craft being powered and surrounded by an intense gravitational field. How are the radio waves getting into this thing. This, it just didn't make sense. But again, very few things did there. And I didn't have much of an opportunity to connect all the dots. But um, it lifted off the ground silently. There was an obvious uh, high voltage corona discharge. It was beginning to get a little late, but you could see the purple blue glow. But as soon as it lifted off, you know, six, 10 feet, that dissipated. And it just moved around. And, sat back down where it was, but it wasn't, it doesn't sound like much, but it was incredibly imp impressive. There wasn't, there wasn't a sound other than a, a little hiss when it first took off, but you know, it's a, a big device. It moved around and, uh, and sat down and I mean, I was just, I was beaming. It was so cool. Uh, you didn't get to see, it didn't fly off to Venus or anything and people. No, no, it. no, no. This, this is their, this is their prize catch here. I mean, they, no one is going out there and taking it out of the atmosphere and risking it. I mean, that was a big deal. Um, but you know, it like that. It could have. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I don't know if they knew how to get it into that mode, but, um, you know, like the test flight data that I saw, they even uh, were very careful on what days to take it above the mountain range where traffic was at, low, at its lowest in the surrounding area. So they were very concerned about who could see what and you know, how much they risk the thing moving around, but it was, uh, it was quite a prized possession of theirs. So you saw the, the <laughs> reactor up close, and you saw the craft inside, not only the test, but you got in it. Yeah, it later, on, later on it was, uh, again, you know, we have to look at, at everything. We're trying to figure out how uh, this device works from nothing. So 
uh, and it's technology you know, we can barely grasp. So, uh, you know, obviously the placement, orientation of the components and subcomponents might be critical to the operation of it. So, um, I was let in uh, one time. There were several other technicians in there doing their own thing. I don't know what they were working on, but we wanted to see where the reactor was, how it, you know, how it was positioned, um, you know, where the amplifiers were. And this is when, you know, I described to you there was uh, access to a lower level to where the uh, emitters were, which was a, a small hexagon shaped area that had a, what I thought was a really creative collapsible uh, doorway. And um, I guess the only analogy is if you take a, oh, you know, a six pack of beer that comes in bottles and you take out the little divider there, it's, if you stand it up by itself, it's really strong. It'll hold a lot of weight, but you can easily collapse it flat by the side. Um, this is essentially a metal version of that, and it was in a, a hexagon shape with a little hole, and you can walk on it, but you can just put your finger in the hole and pop it, and the whole thing snaps over to where you have a you know, hole you can kind of stick your head upside down in, which is what I did. I just leaned in there, and they wanted to me to see how the, uh, specifically how the arms that held the uh, emitters connected to the bottoms of the amplifiers, and those in themselves were fantastic technology. Describe the interior, what it looks like. It's very, it very bland. If I, uh, again, was to give you an analogy, I would say it was if you put all these components in there, pretended everything was made out of wax, heat it up for a bit and let it cool off. There was never a sharp angle anywhere. Anytime something sat somewhere perpendicular to it, it had a radius of curvature to it. Um, everything had a smooth curve. Everywhere it was all one color. Um, was it all one piece? It it looks like it was one giant inject and molded thing, but there was not there was not a seam, there was not a rivet, there was not a fastener. It was just all there. Any buttons? Any no, you know, no place to put in the key and no, the and there's no wiring. You mentioned about I'll, I'll use the term furniture because you got a lot. We both got a lot of grief. <laughs> to furniture, yeah. yeah. Well, that was because I was, you, this was, I think, the first interview on TV, and I was, well, I was frightened for a couple of reasons. First of all, I wasn't supposed to be saying anything, and the fact that it was on TV, and I didn't know what kind of big mistake this was. And um, uh, so You asked me what was inside or described, and I was trying to work, think of the word seats, and I couldn't in a million years get that out of my mind, and all I could say is there's furniture in there and I know it sounded ridiculous and everybody said well that guy can't be a scientist he doesn't even know what the word seat is in and, you know it's just stress does that to you it was the size of it though it was small yeah it was yeah furniture. well yeah that's 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 quite a critical point everything was very small it looked like uh, well maybe that's where the it popped into my mind because I was thinking of uh, you know the children's you know furniture set or tea set you get for little kids that have you know, the little molded chairs and little tiny, but that's exactly what it looked like. It looked like a little furniture set for, for kids. So, um, and obviously it was uncomfortable to, to walk around and when you first come in the side, you have to hunch over. The only place you can stand up comfortably is, you know, right by the reactor in the side. So whatever built or used the thing was obviously smaller than, than my stature. I'll come back to the term, the kids. <coughs> uh, so somebody did the test, somebody was in it, they must have figured out a little bit of how it operates. Uh, but yeah, obviously, and the, in the sport model, the one that I went in, they removed one of the uh, amplifiers, which was really shocking to me. Um, then it, now, the reactor and emitter, all those were in that one, so these must have, that must have come from another craft, which made me at least partially to believe that these all may have the same power systems in them, which you know really makes you think that's. So the one you had in the lab that you were working with. Yeah, was the components the same, had to come from same somewhere. Same one else. that was in the in the sport models. Yeah, but wasn't the sport models. So at uh, you know, you can extrapolate and say 
they all yeah, like yeah it's can, kind of like a One Chevy. They all have the same kind of engine and are different, uh, but I, I don't know. It's all conjecture. Let's talk about the fuel. So big, um, it's an interesting part of the story and a bone of contention for a lot of folks. Element 115. How did you know it was 115? Describe its properties. Describe its properties. Why, what does it do? What, what, why well, is it so miraculous? Well, I, it, uh, let me put it this way. The, uh, we weren't given the task to say, you know, analyze the fuel, find out what it is, and, you know, they just, again, the thing was, and there was a lot of push to it, was to, what is that, and do we have any? And, um, you know, that's, that's it. And these guys really do <laughs> talk and think like that. It's just, you know, what did you guys do today? We just looked at this the other day. But, um, you know, I mean, we, it, if you remove the top of the reactor, there's a little tower in there with a cap, and there is a uh, triangular piece of fuel in there, what we call the fuel, because if you put that in, everything starts to work. We analyzed what was there. Now, somehow, again, we didn't have access to all the information, but somehow Los Alamos had something to do with either keeping or storing the fuel. Now, it's, uh, we did all kinds of tests on it, not just us, we had a sent all that equipment isn't there. We don't have, you know, all kinds of interesting spectrographs. But um, we had it tested and we just wanted to see where this was on the periodic chart, what kind of peaks we get off of it, and, you know, maybe it's just, you know, a unique fuel, maybe it's just some you know, a blend of a nuclear material. But when it became obvious that this isn't even on our usable periodic chart, you know, that's, that's essentially where we stopped, you know, and said it, we weren't going to analyze the material and see if we could make it. We just wanted to know if it was something that we could possibly use, and it wasn't. You told so, me that we couldn't make it. Why, why couldn't we make it? Well, just like any heavy element or super heavy element, more specifically, um, you know, the only naturally occurring heavy elements, uh, uranium. I mean, as soon as you get anything heavier than that, you know, a larger number of protons, you have to make artificially. And that's, that's a difficult job because you either like to make plutonium, which our country loves, you know, you have to take, um, you know, other materials, put them in a reactor, let it run for a couple of years, and then you can, in the case of plutonium, you can chemically separate out, you know, the small quantity of that. Now, even heavier elements, you have there's more difficulty obtaining. Um, you know, extremely heavy ones, like 110. You, I mean, you have to make that on an atom by atom basis, an accelerator, where you're, you know, slamming, accelerating single atoms or beams of other atoms, uh, you know, near the speed of light, smacking them together, and it doesn't make a usable quantity. I mean. The, you may get the interaction you want and it flies off and hits a detector you know at a fraction of the speed of light and you go that was 115 and you know that's when they say we well, you know we synthesize one that's what it is it's not like a cup pops out and we've we've got some you know it's uh, it's just a you know a particle comes flying out and we go well at at these angles at this magnetic moment at that speed it will be 115 and if you get a peek at that you know boom, it comes off, it's a little display on a thing, and right, we, we made 115. But, you know, to actually make usable quantities, d d forget it, it would take, you know, the entire resource, resources of a country d d forever, you know, to get a gram or so. How much was up there? Well, they say there was 500 pounds of the material. Now, was that recovered in a craft? Was that separate? Uh, they certainly didn't synthesize it, but, uh, you know, where it came from, I, I have no idea, yes. but, it, but again, <laughs> Los Alamos had something to do with it because they, they renamed it LA-1000. I know there are shipments back and forth there, but I, I think it had to be, from what I understand, it had to, the, if you assume a cylinder of this material, it has to be machined into a cone, and that cone sliced, uh, well, it has to be stacked first, like a bunch of quarters stacked on top of one another then machined into a cone, and then sliced to be usable in the reactor. Now, all of that had to do with the metallurgical guys, and we weren't even allowed to know why, but I knew that was necessary for 
whatever it's worth. Reactor doesn't work without 115. Did you ever do an experiment to try some other kind of fuel? No, no. Okay. I, mean, we, I mean, quite honestly, we really didn't know what was going on there. I mean, we had a basic idea of, at least we thought, again, we just had to report to what was going on, so it's not like you can ever say, you know, we really don't know. We've been working on this two weeks. You better come up with something. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, look, we think it's a, we think it's an accelerator, and you know, we, we we've identified that that's, you know, 114, 115, 160. It looks like it's 115. It's an element, and you have to explain this stuff to guys that absolutely have minimal scientific background, and just try that when you're dealing with stuff that's not even, you know, from the earth. So how does it work? I mean, uh, how does it work, um, what you learn? You, you get a piece of it, uh, a triangle, it's in, the, and, and how does it, what, it what function? Really, you just put the, uh, I, I wish I had that model that... Uh, it's in my car. Show me. Is it really? <laughs> okay. Um, you, you, you just put the, the fuel in there, you, there's, a, there's a little cap that sits on top, and then as soon as you put, yet nothing happens, but as soon as you put the lid on, it turns on. There's no on switch. Yeah, it's just, it's like it attains resonance or something. It just is on. Which makes you wonder, how does it work in the craft? Because no one's taken the lid off, because in the craft, it sits on the ground, and there's a conduit that sits over it and goes to the top of the craft. So, but it's not clear how anything works in the craft. And it generates... Gravity. Oh, yeah. Creates. Yeah, okay. it generates its own gra artificial gravitational field, and that lifts the craft off the ground. We've had conversations uh, in private about how this accounts for some UFO cases. I mean, it, it, it in effect achieves invisibility in a sense. You can be saying right now. Oh, right yeah, there. absolutely. Yeah, because light, it, it will bend it around there. And it, I'm, yeah. Sorry, I didn't leave that. <laughs> I left out that pretty important observation. When the craft was up, I mean, you could walk underneath and look straight up, and you can't see the craft until you step to the side, and it becomes visible again. It's quite, it's quite amazing, you know. So it it bend, well, it bends it bends light, just like uh, you know, you could see on a, a hot roadway in the summertime how how heat would affect that coming off of uh, you know. But here you're. It, it, you're in a much more controlled situation, and the, way, the shape of the gravitational field, the artificial field around the craft, if you look at that and then we're able to stand at different vantage points, you can just look around it. Now, this isn't something new. We know this from you know, looking at faraway stars. Uh, they, it, they call it gravitational lensing where a star might be over here, but because we're looking around another star, it bends light and, you know, but here again, here is an artificial source, a machine that does this, and that's everything. But yeah, all, like I said, all the science fiction things become reality. There's your invisibility cloak, there's your, you know, impenetrable force field, here's your field propulsion system, and, you know, here's e you're even beginning to tamper with, you know, potential time travel. It occurs to you, hey, this could work not only in space but underwater. Maybe that's why the Navy's interested in running the program. I mean, that, it's odd, isn't it, that it's the U.S. Navy running the program out there? You know, that never occurred to me. <laughs> no, I, never, I swear to this, I never even thought about that thing operating underwater. It I would wonder work how, just fine, though, wouldn't it? I guess. I, I don't <laughs> know. I, don't, I mean, yeah, I don't understand why I wouldn't, but um, it'd be interesting to see what the water does. You had said, I remember, it, it, I could barely get my pointy little head around it when we were first talking about this, but that uh, if somebody had one of these and were out in space and wanted to come to Earth, in essence, they're not propelling themselves toward Earth. It works differently, right? They're yeah, yeah. In fact, the two modes that the uh, craft operated on are... Um, yeah, they label Delta and Omicron configuration. Delta meaning using all three... Uh, uh, amplifiers and Omicron obviously meaning just one and the way the craft would work is um, let me get rid of my reactor here now I'm gonna draw a really bad flying saucer here. all right so normally the um, 
you would have the three amplifiers hanging, or the three emitters hanging down in Omicron mode, a single one would sling, swing sideways, and you would have the other two sitting like that. Now, what happens is the two that are facing straight down essentially act like a pedestal where they just keep the craft steady. The one swung out to the side um, creates a gravitational distortion off the edge. And these th in, in Omicron configuration, these things really fly unstable. They're, they do not look like uh, in any sort of high-tech uh, technology. It, uh, to give you an example, if you put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed, and two feet away you take your fist and you push it down, the bowling ball rolls towards it. And that's exactly how the craft operates. It focuses the, the single emitter and creates a gravity distortion, essentially a divot in space-time, and the craft rolls forward you know, in the distortion. So that's basically how the thing moves around. So, and this is opposed to our conventional uh, propulsion, whether you're using uh, you know, a jet, a rocket, a propeller, we always take something and accelerate it out the back using the action-reaction principle and you know, push forward. And these guys are doing it exactly opposite. They're creating a distortion in front and you know, tucking towards it. Uh, when Element 115, of course, when you're talking about this stuff, it did not exist. We're still years away from it. But you, you had told me in that first interview, look, uh, we believe that there was an island of stability somewhere, 115, 116, somewhere in there. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe someday we'll be able to make it. It didn't exist then, but they've made it since. Tiny little piece, as you said. When that news Adam comes out, people say, some people said, aha, Bob was right. Others people say, aha, Bob was wrong, because this isn't 115 at all. It doesn't behave anything like what you said. There's not 500 pounds of it, that's for sure. So, you know, There's not 500 pounds of it. I mean, it. like they had up there. We <laughs> couldn't make 500 pounds of it. No, no, obviously not. And, well, look, I mean, you're talking about physical quantities and also, you know, atom quantities from fabricating it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, the island of stability isn't something that we came up with. I mean, that's been theorized since probably the 50s that it, you know, it just looks like in the, uh, um, you know, physical makeup or just the geometric stacking, I guess, of protons and neutrons. It's certain combinations, they're stable, and other combinations, they're not. Well, it, you know, it looked like further up in the periodic chart, boy, if we have had, ever had anything with 115 protons or something in that range, it looks like that might become stable. And, you know, that was actually in our minds when we were trying to identify it. I said, boy, this thing is off the charts. You know, is it, are we looking at the island of stability? And um, I'm beginning to get lost here. Well, where, I was where, asking where are we about going with this? The 114 that was synthesized. Oh, yeah, so the, the 115. Again, you know, I think they, what did they whack together? Uh, calcium and... Uh, uh, I don't know, bismuth or something like that. But they did a, they did a unique collision and accelerators, and they made yeah, a few atoms of it, and they went, this is you know, 115, and it decayed. Now, obviously, this is a stable material. but um, A different isotope. Yeah, it's like I said. There's, uh, you know, we have hydrogen that's uh, you know, one on the periodic chart, just like 115 is 115. It has one proton, 115 has 115 protons. Well, there's hydrogen, which is protium, which we're all familiar with, hydrogen gas. It's flammable, it's stable, it doesn't, you know, decay. But there's, you know, two other isotopes of hydrogen. There's still hydrogen, there's still element one. And, you know, one we call deuterium has two protons. It's, uh, it's also stable, um, but it's different. It's heavier. And there's a, another one called tritium, which is radioactive, and it decays. About well, half-life, about 12 and a half years. Um, again, they're different isotopes. They have different numbers of neutrons. They have the same amount of protons, so it's the same thing. No doubt 115 has the, the God knows how many isotopes. Um, we know at least one is stable. There's probably, you know, several that are unstable. And, you know, again, they, if they keep playing around with it, and I don't see why they wouldn't, I'm sure they're going to find a stable isotope. And the whole idea of um, anti-gravity propulsion 
I, we've heard it from scientists. Ah, that guy, does, Lazar doesn't know what he's talking about. That's impossible. It violates this. It violates that. I mean, you, you've heard that. You've dealt with it. I mean, yeah, yeah I was one of the guys that say it violates yeah. this and violates that. You would have said that, that before, yeah. yeah. And you would have said things about UFO people. This can't be. I mean, you were pretty dismissive uh, about it. Right, which is the way I shouldn't be, you know, and I, I give a lot of people, you know, crap about that too because, you know, look, if you're going to, if you're going to work in a scientific field, you're going to be a scientist in, you know, in any capacity. The most important thing is to keep an open mind because, uh, you know, look, back in time they said, you know, 30 miles an hour is the fastest a human body can possibly take, and that was written as a scientific fact. I mean, that's what scientists believed then, and they all agreed on it. And, you know, how many other things are we, you know, they said, this is the way it is. You, you cannot do that. You know, you have to keep an open mind. It, look, flying saucers, I used to laugh at John Lear and have a good time of it. I still do, but that's a different story. <laughs> but, um, you know, but um, I have to give him credit. You know, he was talking about, you know, they have flying saucers up at the Area 51. Really, John, you know, I just be an adult now. But, um, you know, the, uh, uh, there's a lot. And as far as the technology, yeah, it violates a lot of what we know, which concerns me because some of the things we know are laws and the reason we call them laws and not theories is because they've been verified time and time again you know at, at, with experimental proof and you know that's supposed to be cast in stone so you don't want to see anything that violates the law do you see any aliens up there i know several of the people who submitted questions wanted to ask about aliens i mean the only you did see you know, this, the this came from, yeah, the, now the diagram you want to call that seeing an alien. The only other time, and I know it's because this one incident I told, that one time I was being led in and dragged my hand across the craft. Um, we went in that door, there's a corridor to the right, and you immediately turn to go to the labs. Well, as you turn to the right, there's a door, and it has a small, you know, window on it that has the little wires running through it. I peeked in there as we turned the corner, and that's when I saw, I, I've told you this before, there were two guys there and a little tiny thing that they were looking down at, you know, and, and I just walked by, told to keep my eyes forward, and, you know, I, I think I told Gene that and a couple other people, and I said, well, you probably saw, well, not that Gene said that, but, you know, well, you probably saw an alien or whatever. I don't think that was the case. I, I think even to this day, I think they, they had a little doll or something because they were trying to find out, you know, whatever size creature would fit in the craft and, you, you know, they were you recognize the term the kids? Did you ever hear the term the kids? Yeah. And that's referring to? The creatures that ran the craft. So the, they called them the kids wherever these yeah. craft came from. But you never got an answer how we got them? Or no, that them. was just incidental talking that you know, so had nothing to do with me. You, you know, you've heard all the stuff over the years. They of those who don't believe your story, they believe you're either making it up or it's disinformation, that you're working for them out there that's spreading the story. Not, <laughs> so you're making it up? No, no, you, sorry. Could you make it up? No, really? No, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's way too much for me to handle. Um, no, really, I don't, uh, and I know, look, a lot of people are into, you know, UFO stuff and I just kind of exploded onto the scene and said, hey, I don't follow UFOs, I don't follow reports, I don't know who's researching what, I don't know the names of people involved. And, um, but on the other hand, you know, I know people make their living doing this sort of thing. And um, you know, if I just pop in one day and say, hey, this happened to me, I did this and this and this, but you know, I'm, I'm out, I'm not part of this, um, I can understand how that can interfere with their you know, income stream or their belief system or whatever, and they need to attack me. But look, I'm this. What I said happened. Absolutely happened. Period. That's it. You know, I've been speaking about you for a long time. A couple times a year, I'll go. I'll, I'll explain the story from my perspective and and defend you because. It deserves to be defended, and I believe the story as, as it's been told. But, you know, you go out there and you hear all kinds of, of, of crazy theories about uh, what you're doing and who you work for and everything. And, and um, 
there are those who have a lot of trouble with it. Um, I, I can understand that. Look, if the tables were reversed, I honestly could not say I would believe my stories. Look, there's not enough. I can't provide enough information, and some, in some cases won't, to, you know, to back up my story. And, um, you know, if the tables are reversed, I, I have to take that other side and go, look, guy, um, unless you can, you know, provide more proof, um, it's, I just can't say that, you know, I'm behind it. And I, I have to agree with that. So why did things go south for you? It seems like the, a scientist dream to work on a program like this. Why in the world would you walk away from that or tell anybody else about it? Do you, were you picked because they figured you would tell somebody about it? No. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, um, I mean, well, what happened was, I mean, it was kind of more of a personal nature between my wife and I at that time. Now, it's not like I had a nine to five job and they said, you know, come out at these hours. It was, it was really a sketchy setup that they would call me. Um, the place at EG&G by the airport, what, what was that? It was I, on Sunset Road over, yeah. I, I think it was called something, I can't remember. Anyway, they would call me and say, you know, it's now 8.45, by 9.15 we expect you to be, you know, at the building and, and board the craft and, you know, the airplane, aircraft. not the craft. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and it would be at a, at a moment's notice like that. Well, and look, I was so, really thrilled to be part of this project. Um, I was keeping with the whole program. Like, I couldn't talk to my wife. You know, I said, look, I'm working at, at the test site there. It's on, I said, it's on secret and nuclear stuff, you know, and the, the, that's it. Um, but again, I get calls in the middle of the night. She can't ho hear who they are. And I said, I got to go. It's work. You have to go to work at 8 o'clock at night, and you may not be back, you know, until the middle of the night or the morning. I said, yeah, that's just the way it goes. And that happens you know, time and time again, and, you know, if the phone picks up and, you know, my wife picks it up, they hang up, you know, and, um, you know, until, so then they call back, I pick up the phone, yeah, it's Bob here, and, um, yeah, okay, two hours, I'll be there. <laughs> well, after a while, that seems like something else. In fact, maybe not after a while, but pretty quick. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it's something I could laugh at now, but it, it was not funny then. And, um, you know, I, um, I kept with the program, never said anything to her. And, um, you know, she thought I was having an affair. And, you know, as time went on, going back and forth, um, she, she really didn't have a job or anything to do. So I started, since I was making money from here now, I got her flying lessons down at McCarran Airport and to give her something, you know, to do. And uh, anyway, she started having an affair with the flight instructor. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had no knowledge of this, but, you know, part of the requirements of the project and the security requirements really were to have my phone monitored. Now, I'm going back and forth to work, and now they are listening to this affair progress on the phone that I know nothing about. And, you know, one of the things, one of the main things is that you be, you know, mentally and physically stable. stable. And uh, they're really concerned about that. So it reached a point one day where they didn't call. And they were kind of in a quandary at that point going, they, you know, what are we going to do with Lazar? We got to see either this, you know, affair fizzles out or they break up or whatever, so, you know, I just stopped coming in. I stopped getting calls. I called Dennis. I don't get return calls. And, you know, days are going by, and, you know, now Tracy's going back and forth and flying and doing stuff. She's busy all the time because, you know, she's got a boyfriend. And, you know, I'm beginning to get, now I'm beginning to get really concerned. I mean, these guys are so over the top with security, and you know, we want to know everybody that knows this material. We want to know where they are 24 hours a day, so on and so forth. So they're not even calling me. What's going on? And so I started getting concerned, and it reached a point where I don't know where the breaking point was, but I, I think it, I, I'm pretty sure it was Gene Huff, the first you know guy that you know I talked to, and. Um, 
and said, you know, kind of spilled my guts, hey, look, this is what I've been doing out there, and, you know, told Tracy, too, and... Um, hey, let's go see him. Yeah, well, I, I, had, I also had, I know, we're skipping over lots of stuff, but I had, um, there were, you know, charts of the test flight days, and which days that they were going to go over the mountain and do that, what they call high performance test. So those days, statistically, on that highway they went by, the lowest number of travelers was on a Wednesday night. So Wednesday night, I think 8 o'clock was like the test night. So I thought I knew how long they were going to be in the air. I know all that stuff just from memory. So I told these guys, I said, this is going to be an unbelievable story, but this is what I've been doing, you know, I can go out there and show you guys, but I'm starting to get concerned that they don't like me anymore for some reason, and I'm just going to like disappear. Um, so I just want somebody else to see what I had done in case I'm just gone one day, and at least you guys have a story. Uh, so we go out there, take everybody, and uh, well, you know the story. We Video go out. Time. It's yeah, eight o'clock. Everything happens like I said, and um, you know it lands, and then uh, you know now. It finally hits Tracy, oh my God, he wasn't having an affair. And so, you know, she breaks off the affair, you know, and it, it, it was just a giant mess. It's embarrassing yeah, to bring this and, stuff up. But I mean, it, it is the human side of this story that, that yeah, people, but, the, the other human side, as I alluded to it in my talk, is that there's stuff that happened to you in that period after, after they caught you. The third time they went out, they got caught. And so they want to talk to you, and they're very upset. Dennis, in particular, the guy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So they want to talk to you, and and then a whole series of really bad things start happening. Share with us a little bit about what that period was like, because it's hard to, it's hard to convey it, and that it was really going on, but it was real. Yeah, it was. Um, the uh, well, I guess it started when we got caught. You know, when we got caught that time. Um, I can't quite remember which time that happened, but you know we had we had gone out again with the test flight data uh, two times and been there on Wednesday nights and Gene Huff and we had an ever increasing amount of people that we began to trust to go out there, and uh, which was getting really ridiculous. I think we even brought a motor home out there and we're <laughs> parked out on the road because nothing. Uh... Nothing. Now, you know, once you start getting away with something, you get a little cocky and thinking, oh, boy, they can't see us. And <laughs> so we're out there, and, you know, Gene and I kind of joke around sometimes and say stupid stuff, you know, pretending that someone's out there listening. So we're sitting out there on the dirt road. The test flight time is coming up. We're sitting, leaning on the front of the car, and... You know, I, it's Gene or uh, says something to the effect is, well, I hope they, out there, they don't realize that we've got those other 150, you know, team members out back with, you know, <laughs> automatic weapons and everything, and they're getting ready to storm the base, and I said, they can't possibly know about all those guys, you know, and so it, right after we said that, not, now it's pitch black, it's, you can't see your hand in front of your face, not 50 feet in front of us, you saw a little green thing fall on the ground and roll to us. And they're about saying there, what? And as it turned out, there were a whole bunch of guys standing there in the dark watching us through night vision scopes. And after I said that, a guy dropped one and it rolled over to us. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, they turn on, you know, turn on the lights. Okay, everybody come with us. And you know, that, uh... And I had told the story about the break in the car. I mean, they, I remember going to your house after a break in and yeah. you had the Uzi out, and you're ready to shoot somebody, and then the break-in at the car at the gym. That stuff really happened. It was really going on. Oh, yeah, that was with Mario, the guy um, who's a truck driver now. He um, was going to, uh, you know, we were just working out at a local gym near us, and I was at, the, this was at the probably the highest paranoia stage, and I had a, you know, an Uzi and the, the front and you know Mario and I got to the place and I said okay it's loaded here we're safe to go outside and we open the car doors we close them and we may even make a joke about it we lock the doors we try and open them okay okay the car is secure we go in there and you know joking you think we'll be safe for half an hour and yeah I think we can do it and we you know we come walking out 
there's all the doors, the trunks open, the Uzi's laying out there in my wallet, you know, and we just looked at each other, this is impossible. You know, but uh, yeah, that, that happened. And Mario tells that story probably every day. You, uh, <laughs> at some point, you decided to talk to me. You know, we did that interview in Silhouette. I can't quite remember why, what that, well, I how that happened. There was just too much going on. But yeah, I know at some point, I, and that was really, again, uh, Lear was making a, a big deal. He started naming off the people that he knew that suddenly disappeared. And he said, you know, <laughs> unless you talk to this guy, George Knapp, you know, and if you go out on the air, they'll, you know, they'll be afraid to talk to you. I said, John, they're not afraid to, to, to do anything, you know? It's, but uh, I called you anyway, or he did. And then you know, it kind of hits the fan. They're really mad at him. And, and then that's when a lot of really bad stuff started happening. And then we, we decided to record an interview just for safekeeping in case something happened to him. So it was a couple of hours on tape. And I, under the condition that I wouldn't use that until Bob said, OK. And it was eight months. Eight months until we got the okay, and I worked on him every day to talk him into allowing me to use it and tell the story, uh, assuming he was still alive. And on the day that we were ready to broadcast it, it was part six of a nine-part report, uh, Bob suddenly changes his mind and grabs the videotape. Well, because you were going to say who I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're getting ready to identify him. I'm, we're 10 minutes from going on the air. He's, we're wrestling over the tape. He didn't... So I, as a UFO profiteer and messiah coming forward and making up stories, he was a very reluctant witness, I can tell you. <laughs> um, uh, you regret it. I mean, we heard a little bit of it. At times, you, you certainly regret it. It's it, it you know, changed your a, life. I mean, it's changed you. Yeah, it has. It, um, not, it's not good. This is not no, good. No, I mean, that, that's what's kind of entertaining to me. People, you know, they come, oh, you made up some story. I bet you're making all kinds of money on there. <laughs> where does, where? I want my cut. But um, no, I, and I, you know, to be honest, I did have, I did have the opportunity. I mean, New Line Studios in Columbia, you know, when they heard all this, I mean, the president of Columbia Pictures came down and, yeah, yeah you, well, you were there, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, he said, we're doing this, and you know, and they started giving me screenplays, and I, uh, no, you know. Um, you know, they t it was the James Bond movie. They had me running over the tops of cars. It's like, like look, <laughs> either you tell the story how it happened, or just, or leave me out and just make up a UFO story, but you, you can't, it, it has to be exactly what happened. And so it was just constantly everything being turned down, and it's like, you know what, we're not doing it. I had mentioned before about me going out and, and doing presentations about you, and one of the things I always said is, like, look, Bob doesn't show up at UFO events. He's not cashing in on it. There's nothing wrong with those who do. If, if you can make some money at it, more power to you because it fuels the research. But um, you've, you've never done that before. That's not the case anymore. Why did you decide to come here? I, I, well, I really didn't, you know. I, um... <laughs> You are here. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm here. But um, now I know a lot of people mentioned, you know, 20, look, there's this big UFO, and I've never been to a UFO convention. I mean, I thought they were like Star Trek conventions, people walking around with antennas and stuff. Right? But, um, you know, I didn't want to be have any part of that. And, um, you know, what uh, the people that arranged this and you, and no, this is a the class thing. Just come down. It's 25 years. Once in your life, just say something. And I, you know, I, well, everything I've said has already been said either on the internet, and why would anyone even care to just hear it again? So I finally just said, okay, fine. Just to stop you from hassling me. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but, but wait. But it, it really didn't end there, and that was just a moment of weakness, and then about, you know, about a, and th one of the reasons why is because it was like two or three months away. So I just, yeah, February, fine, whatever you want to do, and then. And then, um, anyway, a few weeks went by, and it kind of hit me that one day that date's going to come around, and, I, you know, so I, I was more than that. Maybe it was... Uh, you know, three or four weeks or something like that. So anyway, I, I called them back here and I said, no, nah, you know, I'm really thinking about not, not doing that and uh, I'm, I'm sorry. And, you know, I told my wife and George and, you know, and I really didn't realize there were this many people <laughs> that were 
interested and you know they said you can't back out you know we've been advertising there's going to be a lot of people here and you know that's and I said you've got 15 or 50 speakers <laughs> or something it's just one less that's going to be here but um, seriously you don't recognize you don't understand that people are so interested in seeing you and hearing from you it doesn't register well not no but I, I appreciate that I do but um, I mean and the, you know they made that clear aside from the fact that they'd sue me if I didn't, so, you know, I said, in a nice way, uh, yeah, in a nice way. Uh, so I, 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 I will go, so I am here. Well, so. the fact that you said that you would do it because I keep pestering you, I take that as a No, and also, I did, you know, I, I, I did give him my word, I do yeah. it, and it's not like I'm, you know, oh, like, it's a, too it's bad. A, it's I, cool, and then I told you, it'd be great, it'd be cool. Well, I'm, <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, when you look at, you heard my the presentation about how far this story has traveled, how many industries and, and businesses it has launched. The extraterrestrial highway, that's from you. Um, the yeah, Las Vegas too. 51's baseball team. Yeah, they, boy, boy, people jumped capitalizing on it really, really quickly. It, it's, it's amazing, a, isn't it? I mean, when you I, see Area 51 mentioned in movies, in some Tom Hanks movie or, you know, Independence Day or something, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah, I guess. It's, uh, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to grasp, you know. It's almost, um, it's, I, I don't know how to describe it. So this, the experience here so far has been pretty good for you? Might you do it again, or might you open up a little bit, or open? You know? There's nothing else. That's the whole story. <laughs> you know. Okay, but, you just told me you got a list of names that I, you haven't given me yet. So. No, I mean, look, I <laughs> believe me, I could really make it easy to verify a bunch of things, and I do not want to do that at all. It, I, I really would prefer people don't buy the story because it makes look. My day-to-day -day life is, has nothing to do with UFOs, and being the UFO guy is a big problem. It's hard to get <laughs> contracts and be, you know, taken seriously. And I, you know, I don't want the last thing I want is, you know, a movie coming out or something like that. It would be a catastrophe. Well, it'd be a great movie if they made it right. Well, I don't know. You know, it, it, it was amazing. A year or so, a couple years ago, the, there's the story about this Russian spy that was killed by use of polonium. And so oh yeah, they called me right National away. National Network yeah. people want to do a story. Let's see, who, where can we get polonium? And they find online, oh, here's a guy who sells it. It's Bob Lazar. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were at the house the, the first day. But um, do you get stopped? I mean, do you, you know, get people stop you on the road? I know you get emails and phone calls. And well, emails, like you know, people asking, you know, questions that, um, you know, that really aren't up on you know, the topic at all. It said, you know, has anyone tried to, you know, duplicate one of these, the crafts? Well, you know, that was the whole aim of the project there. And, but, um, you know, they're just hearing that there's a guy that might have worked on flying saucers and, you know, this is his email address. But by the way, I'm not on Facebook. There's, there are these guys that pretend to be me and I keep getting these emails. Hey, thanks for friending me on Facebook. On What are you talking about? <laughs> so, I, well, it's... I think this is our time. We're up. I've been asking questions from the submitted by folks, including in this, and uh, you know, I think that people are just uh, excited to hear it directly from you tell the story. And, and again, I, I certainly understand why people would have a hard time believing it, but I do it's too. It's true. I do too. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. It really happened. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that way. Thank you. I want to thank you, uh, thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Bob, and uh, maybe I can pester him into doing this again sometime. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you.